Some things in life are very predictable, like our last week in politics here in the UK. Other things not so much, like being invited to have a breakfast time chat with Lembit Opic, which is what I did yesterday. Not a scenario I ever anticipated. Anyway, we discussed the warmest June on record, and in that discussion I referenced a climate paper by the Cirrus Group, which is the Centre for Environmental Research and Earth Sciences. Now they have put together a paper that I don't think nearly enough people have read, and regardless of which side of the CO2 fence you sit on, it's a very important paper. Now I didn't come close to doing it justice during the interview with Lembit. So I thoroughly encourage everyone to read it. There's so much more in it than I covered. But for those of you who aren't keen to read through peer-reviewed climate papers, they do also have a 10-minute video version, which is excellent and also explains much of what is in the paper. Links will be in the description below this video. Another unpredictable occurrence has been the goings-on in Colchester Council have made it across the pond. So in case you missed it, I did an interview with the producer of Climate the Movie, Tom Nelson, a documentary I highly recommend people watch. Who would have ever imagined that Colchester Council could cause this much of a stir around the globe? So links to that will also be in the video description. Now let's uh, move to our summer. <laughs> if you can call it that. I was wondering why we even do. Uh, the hottest June on record, we're told, by climatologists, whoever they are. Well, really? Um, somebody who might have a slightly different view is uh, a human-generated climate change sceptic, Rachel Matthews. Rachel, welcome to today's News Talk TNT. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. First of all, tell us what your interest in this is and where it came from. Why do you care about climate change or what's being said about it, to be more precise? Well, we care because there is so many destructive things being done in the name of saving the planet, namely all these EVs with the lithium mining, which is, I mean, no form of mining is good, but lithium mining is particularly nasty um, with polluting the water supply for 300 years. So we got into it um, via our local council, actually, because they had declared a climate emergency and we went in to find out why and were quite shocked at the amount of EVs that that they have one put on the streets of Colchester and also intend to put more. Uh, so we've pointed out, look, this really isn't good for the environment. What are you doing? And it all comes down to CO2. So then we started to research, OK, is CO2 really such a demon that uh, it's worth all this environmental harm and pollution that is being done in the name of saving the planet? And, you know, I'm from a horticultural background, so we pump CO2 into greenhouses to make plants grow. So you don't really do that with a deadly gas now, do you? So I was a little bit sceptical, but the more and more research that we did, the more it became obvious that, you know, there's many things that drive climate, but CO2 really comes at it from a very minor amount. It does some, but not to the degrees of fear mongering that we're being told by the mainstream media. So I saw a pretty extensive report, which I've had a chance to look at quickly. What did that report tell us? Well, that was um, from the uh, series team who are independently funded scientists. 38 of them came together to look at the IPCC's reports on how they get their data sets. And they looked at the urban measurements versus the rural only measurements. Now, the IPCC say that oh, the difference between them is less than 10%. It's not worth worrying about. But the team went back to the 1850s and looked at all of the data records. And I don't know if you're aware, Lembit, but um, the majority, the vast majority of weather stations are in urban areas um, because it makes sense. If you're going to be taking all those readings, you don't want it in the middle of nowhere. But um, they, what they've discovered is that these urban areas are considerably warmer than rural areas. And in the 1850s, say the weather stations were just on the outskirts of a town or city. Now, with all the developments we've had, they've been absolutely incorporated into an urban environment. So temperatures are much higher. There's only 5% of rural uh, weather stations still exist. They've been all 
gobbled up by urban areas. Now, urban areas only um, take up between two and four percent of the Earth's surface. So you're getting all this data coming in, all this fear mongering is from data that has been you know, not properly adjusted. So in the 1800s, say a weather station in Siberia even, was in the middle of nowhere, no interference from the heat that's generated by all these man-made structures and surfaces, but now it is in an urban area, then those temperature, that rise in temperature has been distorted because of the additional. Now they've done research and they're saying that when you look at rural only, it's 30% lower than the temperatures of the IPC combined. So that's a significant difference that it's a third higher. And when you think that all this data we're getting only comes from about two to 4% of the Earth's surface, that's, so it's not really taking into consideration the sea level surfaces and all those rural areas, you've got to take that into consideration when you're looking at, oh, we've got this global warming, it's the hottest year on record since records began when you're not comparing like for like when those records began. So uh, it's called the heat, urban heat island effect. And essentially, in simple terms, my understanding is if you have a thermometer in a field, <clears throat> it'll be cooler than a thermometer in the middle of a hot car park to oversimplify it because the tarmac just gets hotter. Um, fundamentally, though, my issue, and I make no secret of this, my issue is that while carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, it's not the most important one. Uh, um, water vapour is the most important one. And anyway, uh, a little bit of warming does us good. Uh, there's yes, no I mean, risk far more people of a die runaway... in cold weather than hot. Yeah. So, you know, does it really hurt for it to get a little bit hotter? And, you know, there's so much spurious stuff written and fear mongering because there does seem to be a very driven agenda. There's I don't know if you've seen uh, Climate the movie, but yeah. that really shows how all the academics are pretty much forced into agreeing with anthropogenic climate change. So, you know, when you look at a team that isn't funded by anybody, they take donations like the Cirrus team, then you know, it does give you a completely different picture. And that's something that a good journalist would have taken into account and looked at why, when it's certainly in the UK, nobody is sitting around thinking, oh gosh, isn't it hot with all this global boiling? <laughs> um, that's the other thing that bothers me. Uh, uh, when there's a drought or a flood or a storm, oh, it's climate change. When it snows in Scotland in July, people say, Oh, well, you're just mixing it up with weather. <laughs> but that's what they do all the time. Um, uh, I wonder if the public, as a previous discussion today on my show suggests, the public are wearied of it now. Because the catastrophists have mixed up climate and weather, they can't now unmix them up. So people are now saying we've got a terrible summer, uh, climate emergency is over. Yeah, I mean, they're not doing themselves any favours by as soon as there's an extreme weather event saying it's climate change. So climate is measured over a 30 year period. That is climate. An extreme weather event one way or another, we've actually got less happening in the world now than we used to. If you look at the data going back, including sort of from 1920 onwards, rather than taking it after the 1940s, which is what a lot of the charts and graphs do, you see that actually extreme weather events and forest fires are going down. They're not going up. So it all depends where you start that data set from as to the results you'll get. So, you know, lies and statistics and all that. So, you know, you've really got to take everything with a pinch of salt that you said and look at the long term data yourself. And you can see it very clearly that things are not as bad as they are saying they are. If. I can impose upon you to come onto my Saturday show when we get a whole hour to talk about this. I'd love to, uh, um, because I love the science of this and the science is as close to settled as it can be. There's no climate emergency. And so if I could invite you to my Saturday show, it'd be a real pleasure to explore this in more detail, Rachel, would that be all right? 
Yes, lovely. Although, do bear in mind, I'm not a scientist. I've just read their reports. What yes, someone that... would really get on would be Ronan Connolly, who actually writes this stuff. And then you could go deep into the science. But yes, I'm happy to give you an overview from um, my perspective. Game on. And we'll get the scientists too. We've got many hours to fill and I'd love to have you on. Rachel, real pleasure to speak to you. Uh, that's Rachel Matthews, bringing me to the end of my time today. But...